So he might be around somewhere. Yeah, there's the terms, there's in. Okay, there's in. If you look up in the sky in approximately three minutes' time, you will have a treat because we're going to be visited by a Spitfire of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. And the Spitfire that's coming, I'll tell you about before it comes. And then while it's overhead, I'll keep quiet so that you can enjoy the sound of the lovely Merlin engine. It's a Mark 5B. And the Mark V was the most prolific Spitfire of all. Lots of them were built. This one escorted convoys in the Battle of the Atlantic. And it sounds as if he's here two minutes early. So um, I will be quiet now and will enjoy the sound of this lovely Merlin engine.
finished. And there's a guy We built the mini one. Oh yeah, it was after. 
I don't know. Um, I'm live, by the way. We're bored, yeah. That's what I'm going to get. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry.
Yes, please. I shouldn't have sacked our cameras.
Okay, you off me.
Mr. Prescott, welcome to Prescott Historique. Uh, if you've never been to Prescott or don't know where it is, we're nestling in a fold of the lovely Cotswold Hills near the town of Cheltenham. And this is our annual celebration of historic motor cars. And uh, we've got a wonderful entry of, of all ages up to about 1970. Um, let's amble down and have a look at some of these cars. First of all, we've got five ERAs, ERA English Racing Automobiles, um, were dominated uh, the uh, what was called the Voiturette class in pre-war Grand Prix racing. Voiturette was virtually Formula 2, up against the Maseratis, but they were very successful. They were built in Lincolnshire in uh, Bourne by Raymond Mays. And Raymond was um, a genius at getting other people to pay for his motor racing, um, but he was very successful hill climbing and racing little Bugattis to start with, and then he started English racing automobiles, and from 1933-ish to uh, World War II, he built uh, the company BRA, ERA at Bourne, uh, built a number of racing cars which were hugely successful. Um, Let's have a look, ERA, ERA, and um, over here we've got the little Malik U2, which raced in what was called the Clubman's car class, and then uh, raced in Formula 3 at a time when uh, Formula 3 uh, and Formula Junior were dominated by quite sophisticated rear engine cars, and along came Arthur Malik with a little U2, rather square, body shape and and everybody laughed at him uh, and but they weren't laughing when he came past past them all and uh, proceeded to lead, to lead the race there was a period when um, there was a revolution in uh, sports racing cars from the front-engined Ferraris, Maseratis, Lancias, Jaguar, D-Type, for example, C-Type and D-Type. Then along came uh, the, the rear-engine revolution in single-seater racing cars, followed by the same revolution in uh, sports racing cars, led, I suppose, by the Lotus 23. But Elva, down on the south coast, also built some really successful and very pretty um, rear-engine sports racing cars then we get some there's, there's a history in hill climbing of special building and specials these are homemade cars people who build their own cars and uh, Jeremy's dad here Rivers he built or had built for him this extraordinary little go-kart machine um, I think he drove it twice and it terrified him because the steering was very strange it's got a Triumph twin engine in the back but uh, Jeremy has resurrected it and um, uh, has sorted the steering out so now uh, Jeremy it's not too bad it's very good now on the steering <laughs> and on my last run I've just done I managed to find all the gears in the right order that's a change for you yeah it's a, it's a big change for me so now now what I've got to do is concentrate on driving it quickly. Yeah, do that, thanks. Uh, let's have a look over the road. This beautiful Alfa Romeo from the 20s with its, uh, is it a straight six or a straight eight? And uh, absolutely beautiful body, probably built by Zagato in Italy. But alongside it is um, uh, another unique, well almost unique, there are only two of these. Raymond Mays built some specials, some touring cars. He built five of them I think and two of them still exist and this one has been beautifully restored. It's, uh, the funny thing was that uh, Raymond Mays insisted on it having an, a British V8 engine and there were only two companies making V8s. Um, one was standard with the Autovia and I'm not sure what the other one was, but um, it, it was never terribly successful. Little Cooper, and then a, a unique car, the Wilment. But uh, if we work our way around behind the Wilment, we'll, we'll have a look at the star of the show. And the star of the show, quite rightly, surrounded by a huge crowd, is the V16 BRM, the, the infamous V16 BRM, which uh, was 
was produced in 1949 as a as a world-beating Grand Prix car. But unfortunately, it didn't beat the world. The world beat it. It was unnecessarily complicated with a V16, little one and a half litre V16 engine. Imagine the size of the of the pistons, they're like little uh, motor mower pistons, um, but it did produce about 500 horsepower. The only trouble was the faster the engine went, the more torque uh, tended to spin the rear wheels, so it was pretty much undrivable, and it never won a Grand Prix in its life. But this one is a complete recreation of the original V16 BRM, built by Hall and & Hall, and uh, absolutely perfect. The, um, I was talking to Rob Hall earlier and asked him whether he was tempted to fit it with modern electronics because the, the electrics on the original BRM were always a nightmare. Um, and he said no, they resisted the temptation. It's all absolutely as the original car was. And they are in fact um, producing another one, it's half halfway there, which is going to have the original um, BRM body without all the louvers designed to keep it cool. So we're really looking forward to hearing the V16 BRM start up. If you haven't ever heard it, you won't believe the noise, it's incredible. Moving back towards the start line, and uh, Prescott was discovered by the Vintage Sports Car Club in 1937, and they wanted to buy, the estate was coming up for sale, and they saw this uh, drive up to the big house as the perfect hill climb, but unfortunately they couldn't afford it, so they spoke to their wealthy young friends in the Bugatti Owners Club, and they said, oh yeah, we'll have it, and in 1938, the Bugatti Owners Club acquired uh, Prescott, relayed, resurfaced the, the, the track, and the first competitive meeting at Prescott was in 1938, and uh, the Works Bugatti Grand Prix car came here in 1939, but then, of course, you know what happened at the end of 1939, and uh, Poor old Prescott had to close until the end of World War II, but um, very quickly after the war, it was re it was restored, resurrected, tidied up, and the first meeting after the war took place in uh, 1946, and it was at Prescott that the Cooper made its first competitive appearance, and Sterling Moss made his first single seater competition here at Prescott um, in the little Cooper 500. So we move quickly through the gate and up to the start line because competition on the hill is just about to start. Enjoy your afternoon watching Prescott, I'm sure you will. So, <clears throat> so welcome to Prescott again. We are about to start action on the hill. And I think we're going to start with some parades and some demonstration runs by some of our famous cars that are here this afternoon. And then uh, when they've done their runs, uh, a competitive runs start. And we go through the whole uh, entry who have two runs this afternoon. I think two runs, unless we've got time for to let them have a third run. But uh, these are, c we've had practicing this morning, a couple of runs, actually three runs they did this morning in practice, and, uh, but now it's the real thing, and they are competing. Uh, a number of cars are competing in the Bugatti Owners Club FASI Classic Speed Championship, sponsored by FASI, who make the kind of cranes that go in the, on the back of a big truck and lift the load up and onto and off the, um, the truck. And uh, the second group of cars are competing in the Bugatti Owners Club Members Handicap, which takes place throughout the season, and uh, people score points. And they are handicapped against their best recorded time up the hill. We've also got the, the Healy Sport Championship, a whole gaggle of Austin Healy's, um, mostly the small ones, the Sprites and the MG Midget, but we've got some 
some of the famous frog eye sprite, the little, well, we, you know why it's called a frog eye, from the headlights poking out uh, of the uh, the bonnet in front. And we've also got quite a few of the the bigger six-cylinder Austin Healy's, and indeed a couple of the predecessor to the six-cylinder, the four-cylinder Austin Healy 100, a couple of those, um, and just to round out the Healy story, we've got um, one example of the Jensen Healy, which was built by Jensen and was pretty successful. It had a, a Vauxhall-based engine of 2.2 liters. It was quite successful, sold quite well in the States, and we got one of those. We've also got the Revington TR Register Sprint and Hill Climb Championship for Triumphs. TR Triumphs, we're starting with the TR, have we got a TR2? I don't think so. The, the first of the sports cars produced by Triumph in the early 50s. But we've got a number of TR4s, TR5s, TR6s, and indeed we've got... Uh, a TR7, the funny TR7, which was never very popular, but was quite a successful rally car when it was fitted with the 3.5-litre Rover V8. Another class with um, 10 or so cars in it is the Burt Hadley Memorial Championship. Burt Hadley was uh, snatched out of uh, the Austin um, Apprentice School and uh, because uh, Herbert Austin saw him driving and thought he, we'd better get this guy into our racing cars. And Bert Hadley was the works driver for Austin in the 30s. And uh, indeed, he continued racing well into the 50s. I think he had a couple of entries at Le Mans. But uh, the Bert Hadley Memorial Championship is a championship purely for the Austin 7. And so we've got a number of Austin 7s but with a Maguire Mini we've got a Mini in interloping in this lot uh, driven by Ian Howard it's a funny one we'll talk about it in more detail when it comes up then we've got a small a small invited class from the Vintage Sports Car Club but interesting cars three Rileys Riley TT Sprites and Julian Grimwade's amazing Fraser Nash, single seat racing Fraser Nash with its three and a half litre Alvis engine. We'll talk more about that car when it comes up the hill. <coughs> but we kick off with a parade led by the T. Let me get its number right the T82 Cooper from 1966 built for Formula 2 and uh, this car was driven by Joe Siffert and Joachim Bonnier uh, for Ecurie Suisse for the 1966 Formula 2 season. Then it was sold to Tom Jones uh, in the USA, not Tom Jones the singer, Tom Jones the driver, fitted with a one and a half litre Coventry Climax engine entered it for the 1967 Canadian Grand Prix and then fairly recently was discovered in Florida and it was restored fitted with a, a BRM a little one and a half litre V8 BRM engine and a Hewland Mark 7 gearbox have a quick look at the hill as the Cooper goes up it's just been round a Tory's right hand hairpin little bit of downhill then up into the famous pardon hairpin that uh, lovely pre-war Aston Martin again on its way to pardon and it's followed by the uh, one of two remaining Raymond Mays special touring cars with its V8 engine they built five of these Raymond Mays cars uh, and three of them have disappeared and there are just two remaining one in the united states and one in england this one in england you see the beautiful countryside that uh, prescott lives in 
the rolling Cotswold Hills and we are blessed with a cloudless blue sky. Don't believe people when they say it always rains in England. It only does every now and then. It's lovely because it's a clear, beautiful, clear blue sunshine, but not too hot because we've got a slightly cooling breeze. So we're about 21 degrees, which is comfortable. So the Raymond May special disappears over the finishing line and then about 100 yards after the finishing line there's a sharp left hand hairpin and we do have a, a return, well I call it the return road, it's actually a return track, it's fairly rough, back down to let cars back down into the paddock. So unlike uh, other hill climbs like Chelsea Walsh, we don't have batches of cars coming back down the hill after they've taken their runs. If things go to plan, I think we are due to have small cars coming up the hill doing demonstrations. And if we're lucky, we will see again the incredible uh, V16 BRN. And not only see it, but hear it as well. I suspect we're not immediately going to have some demos. It might well be that we're starting with our first competitive class. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Peter Hughes, who's uh, going to grab the microphone and uh, keep you entertained. So, over to Peter Hughes. Well, thanks once again to uh, Chris there. And uh, just to update you on what the plan is, we are scheduled to have some demonstration runs uh, in just a moment. Once the uh, course cars are clear of the course, then our Bugattis will be taking their two town runs, the ones competing in the Bugatti Owners Club uh, Bugatti series. And then the rest of the classes will take their first run after that. So that is what we uh, await starting, as I say, with some demonstration runs in uh, just a moment or two. The marshals all set. The uh, clerk of the course standing on the start line. Looks like the first car to go up the hill will be the X Roy Lane McLaren M10 Formula 5000 car. Roy, who was uh, four times British hill climb champion and who was also a uh, senior instructor here at the Pembrey uh, Hill Climb School a number of years ago. He won the British Championship in 1975, 76, 92, and 96. Uh, and he was uh, his hill climbing career spanned more than three decades. He won 90 individual rounds of the British Hill Climb Championship, and still holds the record at uh, the Kerbera Sprint Track up in Leicestershire. And uh, 
later in his career he ran a, a uh, Porsche 911 but uh, for much of it he was in uh, big single seaters such as this McLaren which we see going up the hill now raced by uh, Mike Beckwith in that year and then in 66 it was Innes Island who raced it, Ken Simmons in 68 and uh, it's won this historic championships and events in the uh, succeeding years. John Wilmot probably better known for the uh, the Fords uh, that he did odd copies from Fords but uh, this car designed with a V8 BRM, 2 litre V8 BRM engine Powering it. Dennis Island uh, had mechanical problems in a couple of races, but he did win races at uh, Croft up in the north of England. And uh, had a fourth place finish at the Guards Trophy in Brands Hatch. But now we see the remarkable. V16 engine and a one and a half litre engine BRM car that uh, in its day really did struggle with uh, reliability issues but this one has been built it was built uh, just two years ago in fact to the exact specification of the original car uh, the noise it makes is just incomparable to anything else a change of regulations really uh, didn't help it's uh, success. Uh, although it did win on championship events uh, but amongst the drivers who drove the original uh, V16 car Raymond Mays, Ray Sommer, Reg Parnell, Ken Wharton, Mangio, Reg Wharton, Stilly Moss and Jose Foyland Gonzalez all competed in this uh, remarkable car. Uh, BRM from uh, the 1950s now goes up the hill. ERA. This racing automobiles, of course, the uh, organisation created, uh, often born in Lincolnshire by, among others, Raymond Mays, to uh, contest uh, not really the big engine cars, but uh, the small one and a half litre cars of the era. Peter Bertham and uh, Humphrey Cook, the other two uh, people behind the ERA name. The company was formed in 1933 to, as I say, go Wattierette racing. But now we come, as the uh, ERA goes over the finish line, we come to the first of our timed runs of the afternoon. We had practice all morning, of course. Now we switch to the 
rounds at uh, the times that really count. As I say, the uh, Bugattis will take their two runs back to back and the first car away is Edmund Burgess in his Type 51 Bugatti. It's a completely different uh, engine to the uh, Type 35 preceded it, but uh, the same uh, chassis and bodywork. Um, didn't enjoy the same degree of success as the Type 35 had, at least because they were up against a very powerful uh, German setup with Auto Union and uh, Mercedes, both generously funded by the German government at the time. And uh, Type 51, it did take, it did win the French Grand Prix, it also won at Monaco in the hands of Kiribati. Edmund goes over the line, the time of 51.85 seconds. Next up the hill, it is uh, Julian Eckersley and his earlier Type 13, the first uh, true Bugatti, the car built in Molsheim. First one to be built in Molsheim, then it's Tim Dutton in his Type 51. The uh, black and red livery, lovely looking car of Tim's, just going around the Taurus, fittingly enough, for Bugatti. And then on up to Pardon. Pardon on up to Midway. And then it is into the S's. Julian Eckersley does a 63.52 in the Type 13. As uh, Tim Dutton really pushing on up through the uh, S's. And on up to the uh, finish line he goes and does a 55.46. So uh, slower, in fact, than uh, Edmund Burgess. As on the hill now is the older Ugati Brescia of Alex Risk, just going around Pardon. Mike Wrigley also in, out there at the moment in the Type 35B, but going up through the through midway and onto the S's now it is Alex Risk in the brass here there's the type 35B of Mike Wrigley rounding uh, Etores and then around the left hand a card builds that 35B probably the uh, in terms of race wins the most uh, successful Bugatti I would suggest He comes uh, through the S's and on up the hill. And Colin Bullock runs Vittoris uh, in the Type 51. And goes around path. Mike Wrigley's time is 63.79. Alex Risk did an 81.32 in the brass year. And uh, now uh, Peter Livesey is uh, going under the bridge in his Type 13. And around the left hand that brings him up to Etoro. Is this the uh, sort of later addition to uh, this Prescott uh, circuit? Wasn't there when uh, the circuit first opened in 1938? <laughs> Created by the Bugatti Owners Club, of course. Under the bridge now, it's the Type 35B of Alex Ames. And hanging the tail out there as he uh, pushes way up the hill. Around the tail, he's around that tight right hander then. Pretty uh, short straight to the left hand at that part. Gets right out of shape there on the exit of the hairpin, but holds it all together. And through the S's he goes and really, really pushing on. As uh, Colin Bullock, we go to 59.75. 
Alex Ames over the line with a 54.13. So uh, quicker than Tim Dutton, slower, however, than Edmund Burgess. As uh, we see Mike Stiffy in here, Bugatti Brescia just going into part now. 158, and then we will see the second runs in just a moment. As we watch the Brescia through the S's. And there we see Edmund Burgess on his second run, to the Type 51. And uh, Julian Eckersley sits on the start line in the uh, Type 13. Mark Stiffy does a 75.06. So Julian Eckersley gets away. Under the bridge then. And it, is that a problem possibly? I think it might be a problem for the 151 car. Edmund Burgess has bettered his earlier time I think but he does a 51.92. But there is a problem then, and stopping on the hill, unfortunately, Julian Eckersley with uh, some sort of mechanical issue. The red flag goes out. Tim Dutton can't start his run. He's uh, waiting on the start line at the moment, and uh, some work for our marshals here at Prescott to do uh, recovering the Type 13 Bugatti, which at the moment is uh, sitting there on the approach to uh, Etores, marshals are going to uh, just check what the issue is and what type of recovery will be required and uh, then uh, we will get the car moved and uh, continue with the timed runs looks like he's going to run back down the hill just doing a sort of reverse uh, u-turn After the uh, Bugattis, we'll be seeing the contenders in the uh, FASI uh, Classic Speed Championship. Still a couple more of the Bugattis to run, though. As uh, Julian brings his car back down the hill, he should be able to turn off into the paddock very shortly. And then we can uh, resume the runs. So into the paddock he heads, the track should be clear once the gate is closed, the red flag should be coming in very very soon. Tim Dutton has fired the Type 51 up ready for his next run. say Achille Varzi took one of these cars to uh, uh, victory in Monaco the race which we'll be seeing uh, tomorrow of course Monaco Grand Prix tomorrow uh, and he beat uh, amongst others the legendary Tatio Nuvolari to take that win and uh, away then goes Tim a little bit of a squeal of the tyres his way as up to the line now comes the 153 machine that's uh, we'll be got to dress here on Alex Risk as Tim Dutton rounds and a lot of opposite lock as he comes out of uh, Itoris now how can he handle pardon wide on the approach he's uh, cleanly through there though through the left hander and on up in midway towards the S's into the S as he comes. Fairly clean run so far. A little bit wide on the exit. Lifts the front wheel slightly. Then into that right-hander. That takes him around towards the finish line. And over the finish line goes Tim Dutton for a 54.53 second run. While Alex Risk is out there in the Brescia. 
and he heads up from Torres to Pardon. Obviously, you wouldn't expect the Gracia Spirit to match the times of the later cars, the Type 35s and the Type 51s. But Alex really pressing on as hard as he can. He's through midway into the S's now. And a little bit wide on the edge of the uh, second part of the S's there, but he's okay. He's into the final right-hander. Mike Wrigley coming under the bridge in his Type 35B. Wrigley there rounding Etoris. Now it's risks time was a 65.69. Oh. Towards the S as he goes. Final right hand as we switch to see uh, Colin Bullock uh, rounding the Torres in the Type 51. Uh, heading on up towards Pardon, 62.60 the time for Mike Wrigley. Exits pardon on midway to the S as he goes. Left, then right, then left again. Looks like quite a good run for Colin. We'll see the time in a moment. Um, as Peter Livesey makes his way under the bridge and on up towards the Torres. Colin Bullock does a 60.47. Yeah, uh, type 13 then rounds Torres. Heads up on towards Pod. The left hander then goes up for type 13. Into the S's then. This was a, a fairly radical change in philosophy for cars when Toto Bugatti uh, came up with really so moving away from the big, big engine, heavy weight race cars to uh, lighter, more nimble machines, which he felt could be more competitive. And as Alex Ames takes his Type 35B through the S's, Peter Livesey sets a time of 74.31. Last right hander up to the checkered flags and the finish line and a 52.70. Good time there for Alex. 52.70 in the 35B. Max Diffie now is in the Bugatti Brescia. Up towards that first right hander. And Torres. And run is it up to Harden. As then comes the little Bugatti Brescia of Mike Diffie. Just that uh, right hand and then the short blast to the finish line then for the early Bugatti over the line to set a time of 74.78 seconds. Well, next uh, we should get the Bugatti Owners Club Fassi.
two time runs of course Bugattis have now uh, completed their two time runs for the rest of the cars will now run uh, all do their first runs and then all do their second runs after that but, uh, the first car out is the uh, Austin A40 car number 20 The uh, A40 Farina, the car of John Louch. So away goes that uh, small family saloon that was uh, so successful in its day. In the uh, early 60s, I guess. John then heading up to. Vittori is now coming around that right-hander. Looks like a, a very clean run so far. As he heads up towards uh, Pardon. Pardon is on to a midway, of course. And then through the S's he goes. S is into the final right hander. Meanwhile, Andrew Kearney runs the Tories in the, his Hillman Imp. Hillman Imps, which were generally 875cc, some of them were 998cc, but Andrew's is in fact 1020, so obviously been bored out. As uh, we get a time of 58 seconds exactly for John Louch. Very, very immaculate looking mini of Andy Clark He's on the hill going around the part at the moment as Andrew Ken he does it 54.02 and the mini through the S's Car 23 also in a mini, but this time a slightly later one. A mini Clubman that squared off front end as Andy Clark does a Mini Clubman and sets a time of 57 seconds exactly. Austin A35 is driven by Brian Ashley, car number 24. I uh, saw so much amusement when I was in school that uh, probably the uh, the largest teacher in our school, who was way over six foot tall, chose to uh, drive one of these to and from school. How he ever got in and out of it was uh, a mystery to all of us. But, uh, Towards the finish line then comes Brian and does a 57.87. The 105E Ford Anglia of Dave Palm is, uh, on the hill, goes under the bridge and on up towards uh, Etoris. And comes uh, Anglia. And he crosses the line in a time of 56.10. John Barber is in his uh, Fiat Abarth 850 TC. Car which is actually powered by uh, an Auto Bianchi A2 engine, so it's 1050cc in fact. And uh, John bought this car from Italy, I think, in 2010. And it's been campaigned in the Historic Sports Car Club as an Appendix K touring car. 
and in the historic racing driver club uh, touring guest series and it went back to Italy in 2013 to take part in the Vanaska Silver Flag Hill Climb weekend but it's here hill climbing in, in uh, Prescott now and John Barber then heads towards the line over the line in 69.16 well Alistair Clark makes his way up in the uh, Triumph Vitesse Mark II and Mark Hobbs is in the Ford Escort Mark II car number 29 he runs the Tories Nicely set up, this hangs, hangs the tail out just a little bit as he comes out of the last part of the S's. And we've got, we've got uh, a Mark 1 Escort on the hill as well, and that's the car number 30 of Martin Saunders. That's Mark Hobbs, does a 51.42. Martin then coming into the S's in that earlier Escort. Escort's props. Uh, best known for their rally and success but they've had plenty of track success as well in the hands of various people like Broadspeed but uh, Matt Clark is in the Austin Mini goes around Torres and up towards Pardon Martin Saunders time of 54.08 as Matt Clark continues on his way up the hill into the S's now and the nimble little mini making light of uh, things just a little bit wide on the exit of the last part of the S's but nothing to uh, worry about at all and that long sweeping right hand to finish things off and do a time of 50.69 a good time and the Mark 1 Escort is that of Simon Braithwaite car number 33 in the uh, RS 1600 Escort this was the uh, the competition special, as it were, with the uh, 1600 uh, VDA twin cab engine that Ford produced to uh, homologate for rallying. So what time can Simon do as he comes out in the final corner, heads towards the line and does a 51.49. Mini Cooper S, the Mini that everyone aspired to back in the 60s. Morris Mini Cooper S, car number 34. Stephen Akers comes around Pardon the Hairpin. He goes on through midway to the S's. Lee exits the S's. Well, the big rival to the Mini in the day was the Imp, the uh, rear wheel, re uh, rear engine, rear wheel drive car that was meant to compete with the front engine, front wheel drive Mini, which just did a 57.14 on his climb. And you are either in the day an Imp fan or a Mini fan. And I confess I was an Imp fan, but the big problem with Imps was reliability, really. They, they uh, they were very good at blowing head gaskets, unfortunately. Um, and it was that reliability issue, a perceived reliability issue, that I think let saw it lose out badly to the Mini. The Austin A40 Farina of Steve Louch on the hill, but has he got a problem? I think he has slowed right up by the looks of it. And there is a problem then, unfortunately, for car 720. And he's come to a halt and the red flags go out. So it will be a failed run, I'm afraid, for Steve Louch. And the car will need to be recovered before uh, Tim Cross can uh, 
head onto the hill in his MG Midget car number 35, scheduled to run next. So that, uh, unfortunately, one of the shared cars as well that has uh, stopped on the hill, Steve Louch in the A40 Farina, also being driven by John Louch as car number 20, who's already had his first run up the hills. Hopefully it's something that can be sorted relatively easily, and we will see uh, both drivers back out for the second run. The uh, red flag there hanging on the start line to denote that uh, action is on hold at the moment until that car is recovered and returned back to the paddock. <laughs> Quite a warm day uh, here today at Prescott and uh, probably getting a little bit warm being sitting inside the car but the red flags are coming in now and Tim Cross will be able to get underway in that uh, very clean looking MG midget of his in just a moment so away he goes in that uh, well they were uh, 1275 cars at uh, our standard out of the factory but that one has been bought out to 1380cc in fact so uh, a little modified, but uh, on the line now. On the line now, the first of several Reliant Simitar Coupes that we have here today. Car number 36, this is a car of Gary Cox. So Gary gets away as Tim Cross is nearing the end of his run in the midship. And up to the line comes uh, what I would regard as one of the most beautiful cars that we've got here today. And there's a lot to choose from. It really is a great field that we have running here today. But this is the Jaguar XK120 of Ian Beatty that sits on the start line. Car number 39. So Tim Cross's time was a 53.47 as away goes Ian in the uh, Reliant, uh, sorry, in the Jaguar XK120. Uh, my confusion stems from the fact that Ian Stainburn has just brought his Reliant Scimitar Coupe up to the line car number 40. Gary Cox's time in his Scimitar Coupe was a 50.01. So that's something for the other Reliant drivers to aim for. Ian Steinburn then on the hill in the Reliant uh, Scimitar. As Ian Beatty records a time of 56.93. Ian just coming up to uh, pardon. A message for one of our prize winners, Ian Mycock. Ian, uh, could you uh, go to the Raymond Mays touring car, please, in the paddock as soon as possible for your passenger ride up the hill that you've won in the raffle. So I'll see you, Mycock, to 
go to the Raymond Mays Touring Car, please, as we watch uh, Mike Hawley in the Healy Silverstone, slightly unusually powered by a Jaguar engine, as Ian Steinbind does a 58.45 in the Scimitar Coupe. Mike Hawley rounding, pardon, and then on to Midway. Through the S's. Just uh, touch wide on the exit of the uh, left hand part of the S's. Around down the right hander. And towards the line to set a time of 65.44 seconds. So Steve Fenner is on his way in car number 42, the MGB. Left hand drive MGB. Uh, boiled out just a little bit, 1840cc, they were 1800cc as uh, standard. Mike Hawley's time is 65.44, Steve Fenner comes into the S's. Quite a good time for Steve in the MG as he comes to the line. So 53.54, and on the line on the uh, hill now, rather Ted Elway's in one of the numerous uh, Austin Seven specials that we have here today. He's competing in the uh, Gatti Owners Club Fassi Classic Speed Championship, although there is a. Uh, Separate category, I think, for some of the. Yes, there is indeed the Austin Sevens. Some of them are running in the Bird Hadley Memorial Championship. But uh, slightly different from an Austin Seven Special is the Chevrolet Corvette of Timothy Brock car number 45. The uh, 5.8 litre V8 engine Chevrolet comes out of pardon. into the S's and goes that big American car as Ted Elwes does a 71.50 and another Reliant Scimitar Coupe on the hill it's his 52 Terran Scots in his car coming up to Pardon at the moment the Corvette does a 53.72 And we move to sim single seater action with the uh, Brabham BT16 of Ian Baxter. Car number 46M. Rounding. Pop. As uh, Terence Cox stops the clock at 58.17 seconds in the Reliant Scimitar. Packs to doing that little BT 16, 1600cc car, which is going to the line now and does a 45.84. And then we see uh, Jeremy Rivers Fletcher just locking up a bit into, uh, into Pardon in that uh, rather unusual looking Buckler Bal Balamy Special. Certainly not the biggest car at Prescott this weekend. Really is pedalling on in that as he goes through the S's. And we see uh, the sports car, that will be Elva Mark 7, car number 49 of Martin Jones. Rivers Fletcher with a 58.95. Martin Jones wide on the exit of the S's, but it looks like it could still be a pretty good time. Can he get it under the 50 second mark? Yes, he can, Jess, with a 49.95. Meanwhile, uh, Mike White, car number 50 out there in the uh, MG Special. Single seats are coming up towards the S's. Peter 
Thurston in the early Malik Mark IV Malik U2, the car that was uh, so successful in Clubman's racing. 64.76 for the MG Special in the hands of Mike White. And it looks like it's going to be somewhat quicker time for Peter Thurston as he goes under the uh, line there. 46.27 then for Peter. Steve Reese out there in the uh, lovely MG J2 sports car. He comes around to Torres. See the uh, strap on the back for uh, holding everything in place. But Steve then into Pardon. Into the S's, then comes the J2. Lines are set a time of 72.27. You know, another J2 on the hill is that of Nigel Harper, car 161, who is himself going through the S's at the moment. Gypsy GN special, Tom Richardson, is running up towards a pardon. Quite a, a rapid, or can be quite a rapid machine. 72.92 is the time for Nigel Harper. So, uh, less than a second difference between the two J2s. As Tom Richardson comes around that final right hander up to the line and does a 55.79. Away from the line now is Simon Firth Bernard in the Riley 9 Special, car number 163. He goes under the bridge and on up towards the Torres. Around that uh, right hand corner then comes the Riley 9 on up towards Pardon. Looks like he, well, I thought for a moment he might have a problem. He seemed to be slowing and still seems to be running fairly slowly. Now, can he keep it running and get it up to the top of the hill, I wonder, as he comes through into the S's. And it looks like he is still uh, motoring on. Meanwhile, another Riley special at rounding in Torres is the car of Chris Tabor, car number 164. Simon Firth Bernard has managed to complete his run in the time of 74.23 seconds as the uh, second of the Rileys, Chris Tabor, comes through the S's. Uh, the single seater that uh, heads towards its always at the moment is the Fraser Nash Helsley special of David Pryke, car number 165. Chris Tabor completes his run in 61.67 seconds and David Bright comes up to uh, pardon. Through midway and on to the S's then. It's that single seater. Ooh, a bit wide and then a little bit of opposite lock required as he comes out of the S's. Final right hander under the finish line for a time of 55.48. And well, I can see the clerk of the courses car is going out onto the track, so I'm not sure if we can have another demonstration run before we see the uh, remainder of the first runs. This could well be the uh, Raymond Mays 
uh, touring car. Raymond uh, started his own uh, sports car manufacturer. This was in the late 1930s, and uh, uh, maybe to cash in on uh, the ERA single seater success that he had, he uh, the running gear he opted for was from the Standard Motor Company. Uh, but the Raymond May Special is, is powered by a 2.7 litre V8 engine. I think. Uh, Ultimately, there were five of these touring cars built, but uh, as far as I'm aware, only two now remain in the world, and only one remains in Europe. But uh, there is the, uh, on the start line, is the beautiful looking Raymond Mays touring car. Not something you're going to see every day, that's for sure. Beautiful lines. Say 2.7 V8 out of the uh, standard uh, motor company's. Uh, I think it was the Flying 20, the model was known as. It's Peter Burton of uh, ERA who designed the uh, frame for the car. She participated in the 1939 REC rally, in fact. I think this could well be one of our uh, competition prize winners who's uh, having a run up the hill in that car at the moment. The, uh, there was a fundraising raffle held and uh, one of the prizes in that raffle was a passenger ride of Prescott Hill Climb in the Raymond Mays touring car. So that beautiful historic machine making its way uh, through the S's escor escorted by the uh, clerks of the course. unique experience of taking a, a run up the hill in this uh, remarkable car is completed. So some much needed refreshments being uh, delivered to the marshals I suspect, they certainly deserve them, they work hard and without them we wouldn't have an event of course, they do it for the love of the sport, we can never thank them enough and if they are getting some uh, soft drinks to keep them going then that, that's the least they deserve in all honesty. So around Sammy comes the uh, delivery vehicle. Yeah, 
I suspect the course cars will come to back down the hill to uh, reopen it rather than going down the return road but once they are back down at the start line we will then be able to continue with the, uh, the run laps. In fact the clerk of the course is already back in the, just to uh, prove me wrong he has come down the return road and is back on the start line. So these uh, first heats should be back underway in uh, just a moment or two. So I will hand over for the uh, remainder of the uh, first runs to Chris Drewer. We are in business again with car number 60 coming to the line. That's the Buckler. Buckler from Reading. Really were the pioneers in uh, kit cars or selling kits that you built up into your own car. They would provide a, a kind of space frame chassis and, uh, and sometimes a body as well. And you would go to the scrapyard and get a, a Ford Pop engine and uh, a gearbox and some suspension, stick it all together and you've got a nice little sports car. And Carl Talbot's Buckler 90 has got the classic side valve Ford, Ford side valve Ford pop engine. Sadly Simon Durling, although he's in your program, isn't able to bring the Alpine, it's sprung a leak. But David Rose leaves the line in this Classic Lotus 18 Formula Junior. Formula Junior started in 1959 in Italy and they produced some beautiful sort of mini Grand Prix cars, front engine, and uh, had it all to themselves for that year. Then in 1960, Colin Chapman um, came along with the, and uh, John, uh, John Cooper, of course, came along with their rear engine Formula Junior cars and uh, swept them away. And we had the Formula Junior race at Goodwood members meeting a couple of months ago and it was amazing how many of the original front wheel, front um, engined Formula Juniors emerged and they were lovely cars but they were no match for the Lotus and the Cooper. Chris Pring in the LRJ2 on his way. Carl Talbot in the Buckler 61.66, David Rose in the Little Lotus has just been up in 54.36, Chris Spring is with you in the LRJ2 with his Cadillac engine, 
and he's followed by Howard Harmon in uh, a rebodied and much modified TC MG. The TC was the one that MG brought out uh, in about 1946 and was very popular in the States because a lot of American servicemen had been over in Europe during the war and seen these little, uh, they were TAs in those days, and said, oh, I want one of those. And lots of TCs were sold in the States. On the line is this really interesting Lancia-based car of Dominic Hentor, which was made up from the remains of a Lancia Aurelia coupe, which they all rusted away like crazy. And he extracted all the best bits, the engine gearbox, suspension and so on, built up a space frame, and uh, wish bang, there it is. And uh, it's come over, I think last couple of years ago, came over from Italy and makes uh, a fun uh, hill climb car for Dominic. He's uh, into and through the S's. We've got a time for the Allard of 68.58. And on the screen we've got this very pretty black frog eye sprite uh, with wire wheels. They never had wire wheels as standard, but lots of people went to uh, shops like uh, Les Leston's shop and he was selling masses of, of add-on goodies, bolt-on goodies for frog eyes, amongst which of course was uh, wire wheels. And they do look good. Andrew Ivan's on the hill. We'll pick him up in a, a historic car that should have more recognition in the United States than it gets. This is the first ever chaparral built by Jim Hall in California and uh, bought by a great hill climber called Phil Scragg uh, because he thought it would be really competitive in this country but he drove it once or twice and hated it because uh, the handling was all wrong and then it was butchered around a lot but it's now well for for the last few years it's been beautifully rebuilt in fact it's got a new body and gets up the hill in 6403 belongs to Richard Faulkner who's also got Chaparral 2 the one with a fiberglass body and a two-speed automatic gearbox David Slade nearing the finish in the MGB GTS 57.31 Grant Cratchley on his way in the very beautiful little Brabham and into the semicircle comes James Baxter in his huge Formula 5000 Cooper with its uh, five liter uh, Chevy engine. Here's Grant Cratchley rounding pardon and heading into the S's. Brabham had the Brabham Company had the knack of producing all their cars to look really good, really attractive lines. And uh, the BT-18, 21 and so on were really competitive in Formula Junior, Formula 2, not Formula Junior, Formula 2, and eventually, of course, in, in F1 as well. Les Buck goes round Pardon. And into the S's and Grant Cratchley has completed his climb in 48.44 good time what does Les Buck do something's fairly similar I would suspect 49.99 well he'd be pleased to be under the 50 mark Mark Linford. on the line we got the Janetta G12 and in ahead of him Mark Linforth in the Ford Escort Mark 1 which I many people believe has a much more interesting body shape than the Mark 2 had a great successful competition career uh, both on the circuits and uh, on the rally scene so Mark has finished with a 50.17 where's the Ginetta still climbing 
and he's followed by this very nice fairly elderly Porsche Carrera of Tom Robinson going round Orchard Corner having been through under the bridge at 59 miles an hour the G12 is still running doesn't get under the 52nd mark Jeanette have been really successful in recent years with lots of different classes of race cars mark 57.53 Tom Robinson in the Porsche into and through the S's nice line through the S's using up every inch of road meanwhile the TR7 V8 rounds Orchard and into Etoris having been round under the bridge at 68 miles an hour which is pretty quick Tom Robinson in the Porsche 5415 Maxwell Bradley Jones rounds Pardon and uh, Gareth Shand is on the line with the Mark V Austin Healy Sprite TR7 V8 the works cars had a good uh, rally record in the hands of people like Tony Pond finishes with a 50.13 the Sprite is around Orchard Corner heavy braking and then a nice late-ish apex at Etoris we'll keep our focus on the Sprite which is going to be followed by this raucous six-cylinder Austin Healey 3000 of Richard Mason we'll catch up with that later but let's have a look at the Sprite navigating the S's fairly wide exit no harm done can he be under the 60 second mark yes he can with a 55.72 good run here's the Mark 3 the big uh, the Mark 1 Austin E3000 the first uh, six cylinder Austin Healy was the 106 then along came the 300 the 3000 series mark one two three four five Richard Mason finishes with a 55 one three to be followed by this pretty yellow frog eye sprite the reason for the headlights was to co conform with the minimum height above the ground of headlights decreed by American law and originally Austin he thought well we'll put the, the blinking ones in uh, to pop up headlights but then they researched that decided they were unreliable and expensive so they just left them they left them popped up and everybody loves the frog eye 56.46 for Steve Cass is another very pretty frog eye following the great thing about the frog eye sprite was that when you were doing 50 miles an hour it felt like 150 so you didn't really need to go very fast to have a lot of fun here's a rare car following Robert Owen that's Paul Baker's Jensen Healy Roadster really just about the last successful car that Jensen built uh, inspired by the Healy company and powered by a modified Vauxhall based engine sold well in the States but unfortunately like uh, so many cars of that era it didn't, wasn't good at withstanding the corrosion on salty roads and a lot of them just rusted away here's an interesting car this is Michael Berry's Austin Healy 100M the original Austin Healy 100 was quick enough but the 100M had modifications M for modifications one of the most common of which or one of the most visible of which are the louvers in the bonnet and in this country you could buy a 100M complete and finished in the States the cars were delivered with the modifications uh, in boxes in the boot and your dealer your importing dealer had to do the modification himself back to frog eye illustrating the fact that uh, the frog eye sprite spawned a huge offering of um, built bolt-on parts 
on which the the um, fiberglass uh, removable hardtop was one of the most uh, visible features, and all sorts of shapes and sizes came along, including with a you know with a fastback that covered the boot, because the boot, of course, didn't have a boot lid. Novdi Bamra, who I haven't seen here before in his sprite, good run of 52.64. Here's John Darke in the basic Austin Healy 100, and you can see the difference between the 100 and the 100M, although this one, although it's not described as a 100M, does have a louvered bonnet, what the Americans call the hood. And the, and the four-cylinder Austin Healy, the Austin Healy 100, had a very clever folding down windscreen. The, um, the base of the windscreen slid forward and uh, tilted back. And effectively, you had a, 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 in 10 seconds, you got yourself an aero screen. So, Lawrence Maudley is still running now deep. Bamra 52.64 in his sprite. This is Lawrence Maudsley rounding semicircle to record a time 6.0.06. .06. Mike Moore with his Austin Healy sprite with what looks like the Sebring bodywork reminding us that uh, Austin Healy, in their wisdom, entered uh, a team of s sprites, modified frog eye sprites, for the three-hour race at Sebring in Florida. Occasionally uh, got to Sterling Moss to drive for them, and they won their class. Very successful for two or three years running. So this is Phil Gardner, but in the meantime, Mike Moore in his Sprite 58.63, Phil Gardner heading for the finish, Richard Salisbury rounding Torres in the Sebring Sprite. And you can see the body modifications to the hardtop and to the, the bonnet, the front. So it no longer had the frog eye headlights. fairly cautiously out of uh, the final corner of the S's. Notice Tom Rote corner celebrating Tom Rote, who's a famous author and engineer, who was also responsible for rescuing the canals in this country, which were in a state of dereliction after the war. Now, of course, they're a major tourist attraction in this country. Here's Peter Walton in the Austin Healy 3000 in the classic red and white, followed by John Cavendish in sharing the MGB GTS, much modified, reminding us also that uh, MGBs raced at Le Mans in their period. Uh, let's have a look for a time. Peter Walton. Car number 93, 52.95. John Cavendish, round Tom Road corner, up towards the semicircle. Max Shand in another sprite. What we're looking at, of course, is the Revington Healy Sport. Uh, not the Revington, that's the Triumphs. The Healy Sport Championship, which uh, operates through the year and people. Uh, gain points according to their position in the class each time and I think the best eight scores account towards the championship. We've got a very pretty frog eye on the line but in the meantime we're watching Cecile Pritchard in this Austin Healy 3000 Mark One, she's sharing the car with Richard Mason. So we've seen this, we've seen this car just now. Uh, John Cavendish 
tire car number 70. I think I gave you that, 5617. Max Shan, though, 5276, sharing the Austin Healy uh, 3000 Mark 1 with Richard Mace. Good time, 5276. Trish has finished with a 5903. John Tewson on his way in this very attractive custard colored Sprite. Rear suspension on the Frog Eye is interesting because it used quarter, quarter elliptic springs, in other words, half of a semi elliptic spring pointing backwards and supporting the rear axle, but it put a huge strain on the monocoque, on the chassis. And so when the Mark II came out, it was fitted with a proper semi elliptic rear spring. So John Tewson, where is he? He's nearing the finish. He's finished with a 54.96. Here's the TR7 V8 again. This is the car shared seven seven eight. This is the car shared between Max Bart Bradley Jones. sharing with and Pete Fletcher this is Pete Fletcher meanwhile Steve Thomas nearing the finish in the very early TVR TVR Vixen Pete Fletcher did a 52 13 good time and his R4D again driven by Ben Fiddler the most famous ERA of all the works car driven by Raymond Mays by Ken Wharton by Tom uh, jo uh, Flockhart and for 15 years by Mac Halbert who's here today looking on with great interest as Ben takes R4D up the hill. One of uh, a few ERAs fitted with independent front suspension and there's lots of debate about whether that's a good thing or not. 51.18 for Ben in R4D. He also owns AJM1, which is on the line in the hands of Tom Hardman. One and a half litre engine compared with the two litre engine in R4D. But um, Ben tells me that the one and a half litre engine really only struggles against the two litre uh, pulling out of slow corners. So uh, uh, the great majority of pre-war ERAs, ERA, ERAs in the pre-war period, were with one and a half litre engines. And it's only since then when they've been racing in historics that a great many of them have upped their engine capacity to two litres. Ben Fiddler in R4D 51.18. Tom Hardman, there he is on the screen, going around semicircle won't match R4D's time but records a respectable 54.40. Here's David Ellison in the brand new ERA built by David and his partner. Absolutely. It's got an original engine, an engine that came out of R4D, put a rod through the side of Goodwood to be beautifully repaired. The tail of the bodywork is original, but uh, the great majority of the parts have been built, made specially for this recreation of a B-type ERA.
Nice yellow MGB in the hands of Robert Orford. Car number 99. Still competing. Finishes with a 53.52. Then we see Greg Lerigo, who usually competes here at the vintage meeting in a very, very rapid Riley special. But instead, today he's brought uh, a Triumph TR3. The four cylinder Triumph followed on from the original TR2. And uh, the Triumph uh, sports cars, TR2 upwards up to TR6, were really successful. TR7, of which there's an example on the hill in the hands of Jerry Vincent, was not so successful because people looked at it and said, well, I don't like the look of that very much. And um, it looked as if it was going downhill all the time. And so was not a huge sales success. Here's another example with the hood up in the hands of James Small. Jerry Vincent in his TR7, 60 seconds exactly, one minute climb. This is James Small in a TR8. Now that usually means that it's a, it's a TR7 converted to fit the big Rover V8 engine that powered the works TR7 V8s. He'll probably come and tick me off and said, no, no, it's absolutely original. It's always had the V8, but I'm not sure. So James Small gets to the top of the hill in 56.69. Rod Warner in another one, TR7 V8. Much modified load suspension. Slightly wider track, bigger wheels, and uh, a quick car. And the the Buick, or the original Oldsmobile and Buick V8, which was taken up and produced by Rover, can be bored out to something like over five liters. I'm not sure what capacity this one is. I th no, I, I can tell you it's on the original three and a half liter V8. Here's a TR4, which was the first one with the body designed by the Italian Michelotti. And uh, that body design stayed with the TR4, TR5, and then the TR6, also with a Michelotti body, but uh, a different shape from the TR5. He finishes with a 51.43, that's Len Olds. He's followed by Steve Small in yet another TR7 with a V8 engine. I hesitate to go up to these people in the paddock and ask for the size of their engine. But uh, if you hear it leaving the line, you can pretty much tell whether it's a V8 or a four-cylinder engine. Here comes Samantha Brown in another TR4. Had the detachable hard top and the rear screen, I think the rear screen also detached. Um, so you could very quickly turn your nice cozy hardtop uh, TR into an open two-seater. Samantha Brown, where is she? She's into the S's. She's followed by Tom Purvis in his beautifully restored Triumph TR3A. We'll catch a glimpse of it glimpse of it pretty soon. Meanwhile, Samantha heads towards the finish round semicircle. Here's Tom's British Racing Green TR3A. The TR5, similar body, uh, was the first one to have independent rear suspension, which uh, I think improved the handling quite a lot. Tom, yes, well under the 60 second mark, that's fine.
These guys, they're all triumphs and they're taking part in the Revington TR Register Sprint and Hill Climb Championship. Again, another championship that goes through the whole year at various venues. And uh, you count your, I don't know, your eight or so best scores. And it has a quite a complex handicap system to um, equalize the, the cars to a certain extent. Martin Dyson's GT6, interesting car. They came out with the Spitfire on the Herald chassis, of course, with a little four-cylinder engine. And then later on, they produced the GT6 with its two-liter six-cylinder engine in the front and a, and a fastback bodywork. And they were hugely popular. They were called uh, the Mini E-Type. Meanwhile, we go back to the TR4, number 114, in the hands of John Whedon, longtime competitor in this competition. There's a nice car. That's Wendy Weber in the Riley Sprite that's been in their family, oh, for more than 50 years. I think it was bought by her father when he was a student kept it all this time and uh, sadly he died last year but it's great that the family has kept the car and uh, Wendy competes regularly in it but it, it's very pretty bodywork rather inspired by the Italian Alfa Romeos here's a nice Riley it's David Saxel's TT Sprite looking for all the world like a, a Brooklyn's Riley. Mr. Victor Riley, grandson of the founder of the Riley Company, is actually here today. I had a, a very amusing chat with him uh, before lunch. Delightful character. And like so many uh, car companies in Coventry, his granddad, who was a weaver, gave up weaving against European competition and started building bicycles, like so many of the Coventry firms did, and then uh, motorcycles, and then cars. And the Riley Company had a great prestigious history uh, in the 20s and 30s, and then struggled a bit in the in the 40s after the war and uh, joined Lord Nuffield invited Mr. Riley to join the Nuffield organization which eventually, eventually became British Motor Corporation and eventually British Leyland and we won't talk any more about that not a good story we come to the Bert Hadley Memorial Championship for Austin Sevens in both road going and in racing for Bert Hadley was the works driver for Austin in the days when they well they built some very exotic twin cam 750cc racing cars uh, in the late 30s driven by Bert and by uh, my brain has gone K, P K, K Peter was a great uh, driver of these and we kick off with Darren Darchambeau with a 6353 Colin Danks has been up with a 5673 on the hill now Gerald Mullard there he is in a Hamlin bodied Austin 7 Hamlin made, uh, Hamlin made uh, little fiberglass bodies look like bathtubs and you fitted them onto your Austin 7 chassis, which you got from the scrapyard. Let's focus on this interesting Austin 7. Austin 7s were built in Germany under license by BMW, and they were called they were called the Dixie in Germany. They were built under license in France. 
and indeed in Japan. So the Austin 7 really was Herbert Austin's answer to um, the rash of cycle cars which emerged both just before and just after the First World War. And they were monstrous, well, not monstrous, they were flimsy little, little uh, cars, mostly with V-twin air-cooled engines in front and very primitive, often with belt drive transmission. And uh, Herbert Austin said, Oh, these things are no good. Let's build a proper, uh, proper four-cylinder car that the family can all go out in, and that was the famous Austin Seven. Some more times: Gerald Mullard, seventy point one four; Graham Beckett, number one two four, sixty nine point one; and Robert Barbett is just about to finish. He's just going into the S, into semicircle. He's taking it fairly comfortably and will be in the mid 70s with a 70 76 to 9. Here's Nick Allen's amazing Shelsey special rear engine Austin 7 special. So he's got the Austin 7 chassis back to front, shove the engine in the back sideways, chain drive I think to the rear wheels <laughs> and uh, it's very effective 60.86. Let's see if we can find Shirley Tull. There she is in number 128. And she's being followed by David Saxel in this lovely Riley TT Sprite, which we'll see in a second or two. But in the meantime, Shirley is navigating in the middle of the road through the S's. Here's the Riley TT Sprite very quick car really exemplifying the success Riley had uh, in competition we've actually got four ex-works Riley's here today one of which came second overall at Le Mans in 1934 and one of which was uh, driven by two ladies they were the first ladies to uh, enter Le Mans and they, I think they finished 17th or so, but they certainly finished successfully. So we're watching David Saxel. John Louch has brought back the A40 Farina, which I saw being pushed through the paddock as if the clutch had gone, but uh, it seems okay now. And this is uh, the Louch family racing car and uh, it's an early A40 Farina before they sliced the back window so that it was a hatchback and became effectively I think the first hatchback car sold in this country as was the Hillman Imp and here's the Hillman Imp in the hands of Andrew Carney which was um, a fairly sad story because it was technically a very interesting car little Coventry Climax designed engine in the back all aluminium very lightweight engine in the back swing axle front suspension the design team was uh, led by Mike Parks who was eventually a, a Ferrari works driver but the crazy thing about the imp was that the government of the day insisted that it should be built in a new factory in Scotland and all the parts were made in the Midlands done in, in Coventry and so endless train loads of imp bits and pieces bodywork and so on had to be shipped by train up to Scotland where they were made into imps and of course it added a ridiculous amount of cost to the whole process uh, David Saxel in the Riley 67.85 John Louch in the A40 56.53 and Andrew Carney in the M5414. We're watching Ben Thorne in the Austin Mini Clubman, which the Clubman was the one with the rather bluff front rather than the uh, rather than the original basic mini front. And lots of people scratched their heads and said, you know, why produce a front that is much less aerodynamic than the original? But um, 
British Motor Corporation were desperate to make it look as if they'd brought the Mini up to date with some fairly cheap modifications. Ben Thorne has finished with a 56.13. Brian Ashley, number 24, the A35, is heading for the finish. Clock is <coughs> ticking and has ticked at 55.62. Here's Dave Parr, long-time competitor in both this Anglia and in a, a, a Ford Sierra Cosworth, which I think he sold late last year or early this year and I think he's only now competing in the Anglia and for a change of scene we've got John Barber following the Anglia in the Fiat Abarth based on the Fiat 500 here it is but with a bored out engine fettled by Mr. Carlo Abarth who was a genius at extracting power from Fiat engines Dave Pars up the hill in 55.54. Off the line comes Alistair Clark. We'll catch him on the screen a bit later, but he's in the beautifully rebuilt Triumph Vitesse based on the Triumph Herald chassis. But let's focus on the Abarth. As is traditional, it always has the engine cover at the back propped open. And there's always an argument of whether it's for aerodynamic purposes or to keep the engine cool. I'll leave you for a, a few minutes with the view of the Trump V test and hand you back to my mate Peter Hughes. Matt Clark makes his way around uh, Pardon in the uh, Mini, then uh, the time for Martin Saunders in the Escort was a 53.89. Matt making uh, use of all the tarmac there as he comes out of the S's and on towards the finish. Looks like this could be quite a good time in fact. Can he get under 50? No, not quite, but very nearly. 50.39 then for car 31, Mark Clark. Simon Braithwaite in his Escort RS 1600 now going into the S's of the long car number 33. The RS 1600 was the first real performance Escort that Ford built of course. Well, this was the Mexico arguably was, but this was the out and out performance car. 50.95 then for Simon Braithwaite. S of Stephen Akers heading to, into the S's now. Cooper working with uh, Morris and with many builders or many designers to produce that uh, sporting version of the Cooper and the Cooper S. Cooper was uh, 998. I think the Cooper S was originally 1098, if I remember rightly, or, or was it that also 998? Uh, eventually became 1275. Steve Lounge is in the A40 Austin Farina. And 
and uh, he sets a time of 54.04 seconds. His time was a uh, 56.33. And we see Tim Cross in the MG Midget car number 35. Riding the Torres on up the hill. Um, numbers sold, the MG Midget, probably the most successful car, the most, most successful sports car. And uh, Leyland, Fritz Leyland uh, produced. And he goes around Sammy onto the finish line and sets a time of 53.57 as a uh, Gary Cox is making his way up the hill in Reliant Scimitar Coupe, car number 37, just a rounding pardon. Through midway on into the S's. It's, uh, Prescott Hill, a little over 1,100 yards. And there, the absolutely beautiful XK120 car 39, the car of Ian Beattie. As Gary Cox gets under the 50 second mark, there's a 49.78. Ian comes out of pardon. Just the, the lines of this uh, Jaguar sports car to me, just uh, absolute perfection, I think. A bit wide coming out of the uh, left-hander of the S's, but uh, no major problems. As we see the Reliant Scimitar Coupe, another uh, version, this is the one of Ian Stainburn, as Ian Beatty does a 55.56. Ian heads into Park in that uh, Reliant. Always seems strange to me to think that the same company that built the Reliant Robin built one of our sports cars like this as well. out of the S's into Sammy then that red Reliant Scimitar and Sammy and on to the finish line to much of a time of 57.15 as Mike Hawley leaves the line in his uh, Jaguar powered Healy Silverstone Very 50s in my mind, too, about the, the lines and the appearance of the Healy Silverstone. Great car, Healy, of course, Donald Healy, who was involved with so many great cars through to uh, through the Austin Healy's and uh, the Jensen Healy. then coming to the line to set the time of 66.54 Steve Fenner in the left hand drive MGB the uh, Roadster version as opposed to the hardtop uh, GT version of the MG sports car and this looks like quite a good time it's going to be a 52.66 then for Steve as uh, Mark Maynard Brings his imp around the Torres and on up towards Pardon. Into the S's and comes our little yellow rear engine saloon. second runs uh, as Mark goes over the line to set the time of 55.32 and the uh, hugely experienced Ted Elwes in his Austin 7 special running up towards Pardon at the moment. Uh, 
and the S's instead. As we have an off for the Chevrolet Corvette of Tim Brook off onto the grass. No damage done by the looks of it. Can he recover, get back onto the tarmac under his own steam? Well, we'll wait a minute and see. 70.32 then the time for Ted Elwes. And the red flags are out, so I think this is, well, well it will be a, a failed run, unfortunately, for that big Chevrolet Corvette. And... Uh, it uh, means that Terence Cox sits waiting on the start line and his reliance scimitar coupe. And uh, well, I'm not sure whether he can't restart the Chevrolet or whether he can't get traction. I'm not too sure what's happening there at the moment. But he's sitting there on the grass on the, uh, the left hand uh, that would bring him into a Torres. So the marshal's running down to his assistance. We wait to see whether he can get away from there with a little bit of help from the marshals or whether we'll need to uh, send a recovery vehicle up for him. Well, the, uh, Marshall's looking at something on the back corner of the car at the moment. So as I say, unfortunately it's going to be a failed second run then for Timothy Brock in the Chevrolet Corvette. Cox sits uh, patiently on the rely on the uh, start line in the Reliance Scimitar Coupe as we get confirmation it is a fail then for car number 45 for that uh, Chevrolet. Timothy Brook at the wheel. And of course in the, uh, British, the Bugatti Owners Club FASI Classic Speed Championship. And the marshals uh, giving him some assistance to get back onto the tarmac. So he's back on the tarmac, he'll come down the hill and uh, off back into the paddock just uh, after the bridge and then uh, runs will resume assuming there's no clearing uh, of the track to be done and now he's stopped and pulled off part way down and he is going off the course now Just waiting for the final all clear to get the runs back underway. Flags are now about to come in. And it will be car number 52, Terence Cox, in that Reliance Cimitar Coupe that will be next to take their second timed run of the day.
underway then goes Terence Cox, car number 52 in that Reliance Scimitar Coupe up towards the bridge. 58 miles an hour underneath the bridge. And that uh, right hander at Itores on up to Pardon. Touch of the brakes before it turns into the left hand the open. Oh, is it away from there? And on up through midway up towards the S's. Now we see Ian Baxter, the Brummer BT 16 single seater, 1600cc single seater, making his way up now to. Uh, Quite a good run, meanwhile, Terence Cox this time is a 58.47 as Ian comes into the S's and gets very wide, hangs the tail up, just about manages to hold on to it on the exit to the S's into Sammy over the line and a 47.04. Is his time lost because him just a little bit of time with that uh, moment as he came out of the S's but uh, Jeremy Rivers Fletcher comes around pardon in the Buckler Bellamy or Bellamy special he comes into the S's and uh, I knew this car Time in a moment. Martin Jones is also on the hill in the Elva Mark 7. A lovely sports car. 59.74 the time for Rivers Fletcher. Oh, the Elva Sports GT car. And this looks like it could be quite a respectable time as well as he comes around Sammy. Over the line to do a 50.32. And then we see Mike White coming up to Barton in the MG Special. the S's. Peter Thurston made a good start, 72 miles an hour under the bridge from Malley. So he heads up now to Rod's Park. Out of the heaven he goes. White still uh, heading for the finish line, does a 64.65 as Peter Thurston really pushing on through the S's and White for Semi and up to the line and a 46.18 then for Peter Thurston in the Mallet. Steve Reese is in the MGJ2 car number 159 and he is now around the Notorious. Goes up to odds, pardon. Around the left hander. A little bit of undersea, possibly, as he came around there, but uh, nothing too dramatic. Into midway and on up to the S's. the line now. Steve does a 72.21. Nigel Harper also in a J2, also on the hill, coming out of the S's at the moment. Special comes around the pub. Nigel Harper to 69.96. And 
the way he goes towards the finish line. Going over the line to do a 55.20. Also on the hill is uh, not car 153, I think, but car 163. Simon Firth Bernard in the Riley 9 Special is uh, around the Torres and heads left out of Pardon. This isn't Alex Risk, but it is, as I say, car 163, Simon Firth Bernard is uh, heading up now. Through so the S's then goes that Riley Special. Heading towards the finish now, just uh, semi left to tackle as we see another. Riley Special, and this is the uh, car 164 of Christopher Tabor as 163 does a 70.22. Um, out of the S's now, then comes Chris Tabor in 164. Meanwhile, David Pryke is rounding uh, Ettore's in the Fraser Nash Shelsley Special. And Chris Tabor does a 61.36. So the Fraser Nash then uh, heads through Sammy on towards the line. There's a 54.21. Tolba in the Buckler 90. Uh, not up at the moment. It looks like we've got car 61 out there. So, no, that is car 60. That is Carl Tolba, sorry, in the Buckler 90. It's now going up towards the S's. And then Carl does a 60.94. And we get the uh, Lotus 18 form from the junior car of David Rose, car 62, going up towards Pardon currently. and comes the single seater at, uh, early Lotus Formula Junior I guess a forum of Formula Ford really and that it was the uh, class in which many top drivers initially cut their teeth as David Rose is 55.61 we see the lovely Allard J2 of uh, Christopher Bring he's currently around in the Torres Allard on up to Sammy and over the line to set a time of 56.07. Away now goes the MGTC of Howard Harmon, car number 64. Under the bridge and goes the uh, MG sports car. Torres and on up to Pardon turns left into the hairpin. We 
you see the, uh, the distinctive uh, Lancia Aurelia supercharged engine powered single seater of Dominic Hentel. This way around Harden, as Howard Harmon does a 68.25 in the MGTC. The Lancia single seater then coming into the S's now. Right out to the edge at the exit of the S's. Around Sammy and comes. And heads to the finish line to set to time 56.30. On the line at the moment, the Austin Healy Sprite of Noel Hughes. Away he goes. Round the Tories then. The little sports car heads on up to odds. Pardon. Midway then comes the uh, frog eyed sprite. All the way out to the edge of the track as he exits the S's. Around Sammy, on towards the finish line. And the time for Noel Hughes car 66 is 69.77. The uh, track of Jim Hall is I Chaparral 1 of Andrew Ivans is currently heading towards the S's. Left and right and left. And also on the hill is David Slade, car 770 in the MGB GTS. Well, one does a time of 61.92 seconds in the hands of Andrew Ivans. David Slade coming through the S's in the MGB. And the V8 powered Cooper T90 of James Baxter has just come out of Ettore's on up to Pardon. David Slade does a 56.18 in the MGB. James Baxter, who is uh, just rounding Sammy. And over the line at a time of 47.27. And Crutchley is in the uh, sort of nimbler Brabham BT21B, and he is heading up to uh, around Park. Mistral. He's coming into half now as Matt Cratchley does a time of 48.56. There's Buck. Now it's his turn to negotiate the S's cleanly through there. To Sammy and up to the line you'll go to do a 50.81. We go on the hill at the moment. Mark Linfort in his uh, Mark 1 Ford Escort. And the tail out as he comes out of Pardon. And into the S's then goes that uh, Escort. Round Sammy. 
come very sideways. Can he catch it all together? We wait and see. Yes, he did, but that's cost him uh, quite a bit of time. Just about managed to hang on to it. It's a 51.64 for Mark. And then we see the uh, very attractive Janetta G12 of Mark Ponting going into uh, pardon and out of the hairpin he goes. Lovely looking... Uh, Limited production uh, car. Many of the early Janettas were Im Hillman Imp powered. I'm not sure what the G12 uh, sports. But he's about to around semi and uh, set a time of. The clock stops at 61.36 as Thomas Robinson. Makes his way into the S's in the Porsche 911 Carrera. Over the line now and goes the 911 to do a time of 55.27 seconds as uh, Maxwell Riley Jones heads away. It's a uh, throaty sounding Triumph TR7 V8. Which is now heading up towards the Torres. Not the standard dashboard in that uh, car. In the classic uh, TR7 works colours. Colours that they used in rallying. In the hands, as we mentioned before, the likes of Tony Pond and Brian Colton. He comes into the S's there. A bit of. Uh, Wait at the front end of that car with that V8 lump there. At the lighter is the Austin Healy Sprite of uh, Garo Shand, car number 80, who's just rounding a Torres. That five Healy Sprite, this one coming into part. Maxwell Riley Jones does a 50.47 seconds. Shan coming through the S's and that little Austin Healy Sprite. He's going to be followed by a rather larger Austin Healy. And that is the uh, 3000 Mark 1, car number 81, the car of Richard Mason, which is rounding on 55.95, the time for Garo Shand. Richard Mason then coming up towards the S's. Sammy then goes the big Healy. That's around the Torres comes. The little Healy, the Austin Healy Mark 1 Frog Eye Sprite of Stephen Casson, car number 94. And the time for the big Healy was a 55.32. Another frog eye sprite on the hill coming into uh, Etoris is the car of Robert Owen, car number 82. Quite a nice line there around Etoris. Uh, Stephen Casson does a 55.50, so that's the time for Robert Owen to aim for on one of the times. Jensen Healy on the hill at the moment as well. That's the Jensen Healy Roadster, Paul Baker, car number 83, which is heading up towards Pardon as Robert Owen does a 55.38. So just a uh, fraction quicker than the uh, previous Healy Sprite. Baker uh, in the Jensen Healy, and then we have another big Healy, but this time the 100 on the 3000, the Austin Healy 100M, so the four cylinder version of the Austin Healy. Well, the big Healy. 53.40 for Jensen, the Jensen Healy Roadster of Paul Baker, car number 83. Barry in that 100M is coming into the S's. Mm -hmm. 
So, Nauf Bamra in the Austin Healy Sprite comes into Martin. He looks to be pressing on. Another big Healy is the car of John Ducker, car number 87, who's coming up towards uh, Ettore's now. Now Barmer in the Sprite does a 52.51. Has John Ducker around Barton and heads on up the hill. That Healy 100. into the S's. Flip Gardner is in the Austin Healy Ashley Sprite going up towards Pardon currently. As John Decker sets a time of 59.94 so gets under the 60 second mark in the Healy 100. Yes, this goes Philip Gardner in the Healy Ashley Sprite. And in Torres goes uh, Richard Salisbury in the Sebring Sprite. Mm. 59.01 for Philip Gardner in that. Uh, Ashley Sprite, Richard Salisbury in the Seal Drink Sprite just coming through the S's. As the Austin Heath 3000 BT7, car number 93 of Peter Walton heads up to a Torres. Fifty-seven oh seven the time for Richard Salisbury. towards the finish line. There's a time of 52.33 as uh, around the Torres goes uh, Steve Thomas in the TVR Vixen, one of the earlier TVRs. Uh, heading into Pardon. Through midway he goes then and on towards the S's. Robert Orford in the MGB Roadster heads up towards the Taurus, car number 99. Steve Thomas in the TBR does a 53.48, that's car number 98. Robert Orford making his way through the uh, S is in that uh, MGB Roadster. Coming up towards the finish line now and sets a time of 53.75. Well, the hard top MGB GT or GTS of John Cavendish, car 70, is going up towards Pard. And uh, powers his way on up the hill. is the V8 engine trying for TR7 goes around Pardon, that's the car and, uh, car number 778 in those uh, traditional TR7 uh, works colours that's from Sham is rounding the Torres in the Austin Healy Sprite car 880 
Luke Fletcher does a 51.67 in the uh, TR7 V8. really pushing it through the S's but uh, going well but then out onto the grass and then gets it all very very out of shape but manages to pull it all back together again and continues on his way certainly lost time as he comes around Sammy and uh, smoking a little bit as he goes over the line to do a 54.36 another big Healy another 3000 the uh, straight six powered uh, car of uh, Cecile Pritchard as uh, those on uh, live stream can see a replay of the dramas then for the sprite but uh, all uh, ends without any problems as Cecile Pritchard goes uh, around semi and up towards the finish line to set a time of 59.48 John Tewson is out on the hill. He's surrounding a Tories in his a Frog Eye Sprite, car number 89. Around. Pardon, goes this Sprite. That's midway up towards the S's. up to the line to set a time of 54.74 and we see the fabulous ERA D-type of Ben Fiddler rounding Torres and on up towards Pardon goes that uh, gorgeous single seater powers his way out of the hairpin on up towards the S's he goes into the S's Fairly cleanly through there, just a little bit of twitch on the exit. And over the line to do a 51.30. Another ERA is almost also on the hill. That's car 2, David Allison in the B-type ERA, which is currently around the Notorious. Continues to uh, head up. into the SSN comes that uh, distinctive profile of the ERA and David Ellison is about to leave the line but coming up to the finish line in fact that is David Ellison to the 56 point since when we get the ERA AJM1 in fact of Tom Hardman on the hill car number 4 heading into a Taurus at the moment I see you have the right hander on up towards pardon he goes into the left hander S's. And heading up to the finish line to set a time of 54.41. On the start line at the moment, it is the uh, Triumph TR3 car 102, the car of Greg Larigo.
So Greg Larigo on the hill in the very rapid and attractive TR3. He's a great vintage. Uh, Riley hill climber has a very hot Riley special, but today he's brought the TR3. And he's followed by Jerry Vincent in the TR7 sprint. And then there'll be James Small in the TR8, which is on the line at the moment, looking absolutely immaculate. Not something you can really say about uh, Jerry Vincent's car, but it looked, I think you describe it as purposeful. It has a certain, what the antique dealers call patina. But it's quick and successfully through the S's. Here comes the TR8. They were funny looking cars, weren't they? We're all pointing downhill. And uh, as a result, they uh, didn't sell as well as they should have done. Off the line goes uh, Rod Warner in his TR7 V8. Let's see how James Small is getting on. He's in the S's. Meanwhile, Jerry Vincent records a 6104. This is Rod Warner in his TR7 V8. But before that, we've got Len Olds in a TR4. Time for James Small, number 104. He was in the TR8, smart one. He did a 55.92, that's a good time, 55.92. He's followed by Rod Warner, who's nearly at the finish. And then Len Olds has just uh, navigated round Pardon, coming into the S's. James Small, 55.92. Rod Warner, 54.36. We'll see what Len Olds can do. He's heading towards the semicircle, and he's followed by Steve Small, presumably a relative of James, and James just did a 55.92, and Steve, number 109, where is he? No, 108, at rounding pardon. At the moment, um, Len Olds, 50, good time, 50.91, that's quick. Steve Small, here he is in the S's, and then he's followed by Tom Purvis, used to be chairman of the Royal Aut Automobile Club in his immaculate TR3A. And Steve Small finishes with the 53-1-3. We'll watch Tom Purvis. Widish line around the S's. Into Tom Road Corner. And away and up to semicircle. Will Tom get under the 62nd mark? Just, I think. We shall watch 5819. Now we're watching Jeram Croft, Larry Jeram Croft, in his TR7 V8. Many of them have been converted from the four cylinder car, some of them are the X Works Rover powered TR8s. On the line, Martin Dyson in a Triumph GT6. If you, if you like the ultimate car on the Triumph Herald chassis, which um, Triumph Herald, as I keep saying, had a separate chassis, so all sorts of bodies were easy to fit onto it, including, of course, the Spitfire, and then effectively a hard top Spitfire, but with a six cylinder, two litre engine, the GT6 was a great success. On the line we got Wendy Webber in the family Riley Sprite that her dad bought I think when he was a student in the 50s and I can imagine in those days it was for peanuts probably 300 quid or so but it's been in the family ever since and sadly he died last year but um, it's great to see that 
Wendy is upholding the family tradition and hill climbing this lovely sprite. Been carefully maintained, not over restored, and a very pretty shaped body, rather similar to the Alfa Romeo of the same period. She's going to be followed by Julian Grimwade. <coughs> we'll catch him as he comes up through uh, Orchard Corner and up into Ed Torres. But in the meanwhile, we're focusing on Wendy. Here's Julian Grimwade in this famous single-seater uh, Fraser Nash with its three and a half liter Alvis engine, raced with great success by a number of owners, particularly in uh, vintage racing. Put the Frighteners up some, some of the ERAs, certainly on the hills. Chain drive, of course, Fraser Nash. Oof. Julian nearly overcooked it coming out of S's. Four chains taking the part of the back axle and records a 52.72. That's a good time. Also quick is this Austin Ulster of Colin Danks. Chucked it through Pardon. He's recording his best times halfway up the hill at Midway. He's quicker than he's been at all day so uh, it won't be under 50 seconds but uh, probably under 55 or not no 56.95 in the Austin 7 Ulster now Darren Darshombo in his Austin 7 Sports and on the line is Joel Mullard we'll see him a bit later on in the Austin 7 with the Hamlin fiberglass body but let's focus First on uh, Darren Darchambeau. I'm not sure whether he's a Frenchman li living in France, but he's certainly having fun over here in Prescott. Julian Grimwade, 52.72. Colin Danks in car number 120. He recorded a... 56.95 Gerald Mullard is still climbing Darren Darshambo 64.25 now 127 just leaving the line is Robert Barbe in uh, Austin 7 Ulster well it's called an Austin 7 Sports but it's got a, a pointed tail like the Ulster meanwhile Gerald Mullard right at the top of the hill is I think about to record a time Let's watch Robert Barbet. He's modified his Austin 7 front axle to swing axle suspension, which presumably is within the rules of the Austin 7 Club. Gerald Mullard's time 70.93. Here's Robert Barbet at Pardon. And he's followed by Shirley Tull having a fun day in her Austin 7 special. After the Austin 7s, we've got uh, a very small class of vintage sports car club invited cars. David Saxel in the TT Sprite Riley. Julian Grimway we've already seen. Stephen Weber sharing the family uh, with Wendy. And uh, we've seen Wendy. So only two cars to come in that class. And then we've finished the day, I think, with the Bugatti trophy cars although I suspect they had their second run immediately after lunch and resulted in a new record for the Bugatti Ed Burgess has created a new record in his type 51 with a time of 51 and something but it was a very quick time so our grand finale of the day is going to be Ed Burgess in the Type 51 Bugatti, taking a tour d'honneur up Chelsea Walsh. So even if they have, the Bugattis have had their second run, we, I hope, will have another chance to wave and cheer 
Ed Burgess in the black type 51 for breaking the long-standing uh, Bugatti record here at Prescott. Don't forget to look, keep an eye on the um, Bugatti Owners Club website for the dates of future meetings. We've got <coughs> we've got another championship meeting coming up, I think in early September. And if you haven't seen top class hill climbing uh, at Prescott or Chelsea or Loughton Park before, do grab a chance. The speed of the top hill climbers is just astonishing. If I tell you that Sean Gould took his Gould car to an aircraft runway just for the fun of it and recorded zero to 187 miles an hour in 8.7 seconds. Think about that. That is just almost dragster speed. So to watch them coming up through under the bridge at about 120 miles an hour and then uh, the record was broken a couple of years ago by Wallace Mingis, and the record stands at 34.65, which is just amazing. On the screen, if you're watching online, here's Ed Burgess, ready to take the Type 51 out of the paddock. If you're still here, well, if you're not still here, you won't be able to hear what I'm saying, but if you are still here, do give Ed a wave and a clap. He does drive this Type 51 with great spirit, and the car is extremely rapid. You see him pumping, and of course what he's doing is pumping up fuel pressure from the tank in the back up to the engine. Once the car is moving, of course, the fuel is automatically pumped. So Ed probably will do a bump start as he emerges from the paddock. So here we go. Admire this lovely Type 51 Bugatti, driven with great energy by Ed Burgess to record a new Bugatti record, which might well stand for a long time because uh, his Type 51 is one of the quickest Bugattis around. So it's been a great day here at Prescott. We're blessed with wonderful weather, not a cloud in the sky, getting lovely and warm. A brilliant entry of such interesting cars, both competing and demonstrating. I'm not sure whether a type uh, uh, a one and a half litre V16 BRM has ever been here before. But anyway, we've had the real treat of watching and hearing that amazing recreation the BRM in the hands of Rob Hall. That's been a treat. We've seen cars that we've never seen before. We've done seen rare cars. We've seen fast cars. But all of them are interesting cars. If you're watching online, thanks very much for watching. If you're here in person, thanks for coming. Have a good journey home. And my thanks go, of course, as always, to our orange-suited marshals, who, as always, have done a great job, to our clerks of the course, to our hill controllers next door to me here in uh, near the start line, and our timekeepers. Also, of course, to our office staff, who work like Trojans to organize 
uh, this event and other events here at Prescott. It's not an easy job. There are lots of, uh, lots of uh, threads that you have to unpick and uh, untangle, uh, and they do it so successfully and with the minimum of fuss. So thanks to them. Hope you dial into a, a future meeting here at Prescott and let's hope that uh, the weather is as blessed as we've had today. So this is Chris Druitt and Peter Hughes saying thanks for watching. Good night. We'll talk to you again. Motorsport UK TV, the, the home, home of unmissable British motorsport video. Bringing you all the action from the British Championships. Taking you behind the scenes giving you top tips to succeed in every discipline. Showcasing the best equipment. And much, much more. Visit motorsportuk.tv today and make sure you never miss a moment.